Shipping ain't easy, but it's necessary. I be getting weary, cause shit be getting scary. But sit back, relax, and don't you dare worry. Cause I be hitting wrongs with a righteous fury. Yes, sir, see, I am the only one. My name is Josh Dunn, gonna have some fun. Telling the truth, y'all can't handle. I might raise a scandal as I dismantle. The fake make them quake and make them shake. I make you bend, but never will I make you break. Just chill, yo, and don't be frightened. Open that closed mind, it's time to get enlightened. You ready? Welcome, folks, to Gimpin' Ain't Easy Cause It Ain't, episode number 26. So glad to be back. COVID has delayed us a bit, but in lieu of that, we've got another really big show for you here that I'll talk about in just a minute. But before we get to that, as always, I'd like to bring up our sponsors. Our sponsors are open for the time being, so we got to represent for them. This week, we are brought to you once again, as always, by Cafe Sampoil. It is a real Sesame Street where you can find me, Bookbird, in there reading every damn book that Sampoil has to offer cover to cover. This week's feature book is called West Asia. It's a beautiful National Geographic style book from 1979 and it tells you about how folks from Kurdistan lived to be 165 years old and boy howdy the Shah of Iran was a snazzy dresser. Now unfortunately for you I've snapped that book up but fortunately for me you can come over jump in bed and I'll read it to you. Either way someone's gonna be in bed someone's gonna be reading. I don't care who. But we'll get it done. Well, we're also brought to you this week by Charlie's Club, where most shots are 275 on Tuesdays. So even if you make some real bad choices, you won't go broke making them. We're also brought to you this week by the newspaper. Yep, that's right, the newspaper. If people go crazy on toilet paper again, we might have to use the newspaper in 2020. For this week's topic of discussion, I'd like to rap for a minute about popularity. By the ninth grade, I began to have emotional problems, but I began to realize I was different too. I didn't want to fit in, and I still don't, really. Sure, I wanted dates like all the cool guys got, but I wanted to be cool my own way. And I suppose that's why I never really understood why grown adults want to be popular. Just kind of hollow... You know, it doesn't represent true friendship, and I don't really see how it could bring about any kind of real happiness. It's funny, I suppose, for me, being in showbiz, because I suppose that does require a certain degree of popularity or fame, you know, what have you, to be successful. Popularity or fame means I make a living? Yeah, I'll take it. And there's another part of me that I don't think is so egotistical, that desires a certain kind of notoriety so that my beliefs end up changing how we interact and ultimately how the world is run. So maybe that's the most egomaniacal thing of all, that my ideas are so great they could actually make the world better. But right or wrong, egomaniacal or not, I do think my ideas, if implemented, could make the world a better place. Check out my vlog on the Gimpin' Ain't Easy channel called how I would change the world to get hip to my views. So, accepting professional success or changing the world, I have no desire for popularity. I can't fake anything. I can't be good friends for the sake of business. I can be cordial for the sake of business. I can be friendly for the sake of business. But it might be best for me if business comes just purely from the merit of my work or can spring out naturally somehow from true friendship. I, I, I want true friends, and I, I feel I have true friends, and I hope they feel I'm a true friend to them. And I'm up for as many real friends as life can bring me. Real friendship is really important and not something everybody gets to have. I'm a very rich man in that regard. And uh, I certainly don't mean to have any enemies, but I won't tolerate any disrespect. And look, I'm not looking to have problems with people, but if I feel wronged, I'm going to vocalize it. Just about any time when I have felt wrong, all I need really is a simple apology. And hey, if I've wronged somebody, 
I'm going to do my best to make it right. So in closing to this, if popularity is what you're after, cool. But just remember, everyone's friend is no one's friend, really. Folks, I am elated for our guest tonight. He is a internationally renowned Canadian filmmaker, um, theater producer, and writer, and he's done television recently. He has won a slew of awards, uh, too many to name, really, but he's, he's, he's won a genie. He's won the, and, and you can forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this right, the Fipresky European International Critics Prize, the Emerging Master Award at the Seattle International Film Festival. Um, he is a three-time guest uh, for his work at the Sundance Film Festival, that famous Robert Redford one. Uh, he has been in a number of LGBTQ film festivals and won prizes. He's won a slew of prizes in our own, very own Atlantic Film Festival, include um, uh, in 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 our very own Atlantic Film f uh, Fringe Festival, rather for theater. He has won awards all over the states and Canada and Europe. I think uh, the farthest reaching place has been Australia. Again, too many to name. I'm glad I'm getting these off before he comes here. But he is my neighbor. Folks, I can't wait to talk to him tonight. It's Tom Fitzgerald. I'm here with filmmaker, play creator. I think he was even in a theater collective once called the, the Charlatan Theater Collective some years ago. Folks, it's my neighbor. It's Tom Fitzgerald. How are you tonight, Tom? I'm doing great. It's nice to be out visiting you. Yeah, first first time I'd seen you on the uh, passing by Sarah Street for years, and I kind of knew who you were. And then you reached out to me with some classic literature. I said, "Geez, Tom would be great for the podcast, right?" So, yeah, happy to be here. That's excellent. So, and you correct me if I'm wrong. I I believe you were born in New York and then grew up in New Jersey. Is that accurate at all? Yeah, I was born in Westchester County, which is just above the Bronx. And uh, after my parents divorced, when I started school, I, I went over to Bergen County, New Jersey. So I was within 10 minutes of Manhattan, but uh, never in Manhattan until university time. Okay. And uh, what what was uh, growing up like for you? What, what was the childhood of Tom Fitzgerald? <laughs> well... Uh, you know, I'm from a great big New York Irish Catholic family, so it was a lot of uh, cousins and mud pies and uh, brawls at weddings and funerals in the grand New York tradition. And then, um, well, I guess a little of estrangement uh, once my mom ran off to the other side of the Hudson River. And, uh, you know, uh, learning, I guess, a, a suburban, more suburban kind of life. And uh, I always sort of felt like a New Yorker, though. Right. And so um, so you had for a time like a, a, a single parent upbringing from your dad? Or? No, my, my mom uh, ran off with a neighbor. Oh, wow. Yeah, she always claimed that uh, she, she did, they didn't have an affair. They just ran off together. Just kept each other company, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We went on road trips, yeah. yeah. Could be true. Yeah. Um, so did you know from a, a young age like um, that you you want to get into film? Um, when, when did that sort of... I was in? always a great big lover of movies. And I can remember sort of the seventh voyage of Sinbad and, and Logan's Run and these kinds of things that I... I really ate up as a kid. Um, I, I think like everybody, I I dabbled, like not like everybody, but when, when you are exposed to movies, the people that you see are the actors. So I did a lot of acting in uh, high school and university in New York and um, went to school actually to study visual art, painting, drawing, which was um, 
I guess just a talent, a born, a born talent to be able to look at something and, and render it on paper. And then while in school, I, I really sort of discovered the joy of uh, how movies combined all of my favorite things, uh, the theater and photography and painting and writing. So um, it was about, about that age, around 18. Yeah, so cool. That's straight out of high school. And um, I, I know that uh, Kurosawa was a fantastic uh, painter as well. And I, I think people said that his films could not have been uh, so beautiful had, had he not been a painter. So that's interesting. And I did, I did see on your Facebook that you, you had uh, NASCAD on there um, and uh, as, as well as uh, Bon Vivant and some other things <laughs> and stuff like that. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. So, no, it's really cool because I'm like my own personal practice is much uh, more speech and language and communication. So I, I don't really have a strong visual side, but I, I imagine that is um, immensely important for film to have that really strong visual. Well, it's, it's great to have an understanding of how composition works as a director. And I would say that um, in the beginning of my movie making career, I approached it very much like a painter. I, I felt I needed to build the world from scratch. I would build the sets. I would choose the color of every wall and choose the color of the costume or have the costume made from scratch to have a certain color relationship with the background. And it took me a long time to learn actually about the idea of, of cinema as a way of capturing the beauty that already exists in the world. So that's that's been a, a long journey for me. Right, like the the closest you can get to the actual what it what it's really like to represent the 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 physical beauty of that on on screen as as close as you can. Eh? There are very different ways to try to capture the human experience, and you know some artists do it from starting with a completely blank canvas, which is how I sort of learned to approach storytelling. But I think it was, um, you know, those were films like The Hanging Garden and, and Beefcake in the 90s, where I would work in a studio. And um, later, uh, shooting in Europe, um, films like uh, The Wild Dogs or Around the World in Three Needles, it became for me more about trying to find beauty rather than create it, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting um, to like you know start from this this blank canvas and then uh, um, as as you progress trying to get it um, from the, almost going this is a kind of a reach but you know maybe from Plato to Aristotle or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether that's a reach or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I think Plato the 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 thing was in the ideal and and for Aristotle it was in in uh, in nature. So I was curious. Um, do you, do you have um, favorite filmmakers, folks who influenced you the most, perhaps? Sure, I have favorite filmmakers in films. And, uh, you know, in my youth, I thought a lot about Peter Greenaway, um, you know, the draftman's contract, the cook, the thief, his wife and her lover, as a filmmaker who was also sort of carefully building the world from a blank canvas from scratch. Um, not really trying to capture what life uh, is really like in a visceral way, but trying to create it in a more painterly way. Um, but I, I'm actually really a great fan of genre. I mean, my favorite film is Alien. I think I've seen it 50 times. Another film that's like st stunning mm -hmm. in terms of the creation of a world. Is that is that Ridley Scott? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. He's yeah. Um, um, so I didn't. I don't even think I had this wrote written down. But what what was it that attracted you to Halifax? Well, I was going to a university called the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in New York City, and uh, that's a great school uh, downtown near NYU, and um, I. I had always been in the New York area and I was sort of looking to expand my horizons a little bit and, and to sort of see something 
of the world. My film teacher, I think I was taking a scratch animation class where you sort of actually took the role of film and a needle <laughs> actually Ooh, drew wow. right on the cell. Mm. Um, and she recommended uh, NASCAD for having a course in conjunction with the Atlantic Filmmakers Co-op taught by David Middleton. And I, I thought that actually sounded like a great way to spend a term. So I, uh, I signed up to make, I drove up to Nova Scotia on a student exchange program. It was supposed to last three months and it's been uh, 30 odd years now. Wow, from three months to 30 years, that's... It's like Gilligan's Island. Incredible. Yeah, um, so in preparation, I've, I had watched a, a number of your films, not, not everything, but I watched uh, The Hanging Garden, and I watched Beefcake, and I watched Three Needles, and Stage Mother, and I even saw um, the first episode of sex and violence. And what really struck me about your work was that I don't think there is, a, at least not to my uh, untrained eye, a distinctive uh, Tom Fitzgerald style or, or mark. I, I, I thought the pictures were, were all, and this was kind of what most impressed, they were all so, so vastly different, I, I thought, you know, because The Hanging Garden is kind of like a and you can forgive me if I'm miscategorizing in any way. It's kind of, kind of like a, you know, a, a, a maritime story. And then Beefcake is kind of like documentary, but much faster paced and zazzy. Like, I'll meet this guy, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I, uh, it, it took me a minute. I didn't realize that the, the like, the black and white stuff was actually reenactments, you know. Well, some of it wasn't. Some of it wasn't. Oh, okay, that's what did it. That yeah, was part of what I was playing with. Yeah. in that movie. Um, yeah, I was really interested in that era with sort of um, kind of taking at least two different genres in one film and seeing how I could weave them together into something that felt a little bit unique. So The Hanging Garden is sort of a surrealist kitchen sink drama, if you will, right? Um, where the story is very, very open to interpretation, but the, present, uh, the presentation is... Um, very much like a, a family drama, or beefcake um, docu comedy was my idea. <laughs> right, <laughs> to sort of take these very kitschy 1950s and 60s movies that looked very very fake, right, um, and actually talk to the men who made them or appeared in them, and then sort of recreate their stories in a B movie style from that era. Uh, so. You know, it was a great fun trying to create these sort of offshoots of genres. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? And then, like, Three Needles is, um, all, all, like, and again, this might not be the right characterization, but I, I, I saw it as kind of like a, you know, almost a National Geographic or PBS Nature kind of, you know, this uh, wonderful and, and, and really meaningful to me because I don't get to travel a lot. So I, lo I love to see cultures that are, you know, very different from my own. And um, and then in, uh, in in Cloudburst, like uh, that one struck me as the most comical. I, I thought I thought it was very very funny, and um, and then to go into uh, sta stage mother as I, I I would classify as as a musical essentially, right? Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I really try to approach each movie as its own thing, and I know that there's filmmakers who sort of have a very, very strong um, identity in the work and their personality and their interests shine through in everything that they do. I try to not so much take a back seat to the story, but to treat each one as a completely unique work. Um, and so that doesn't mean that I don't work with a lot of the same people from time to time, but we really try to pinpoint what is completely different about the story that we're telling this time around and sort of not really try to emulate what we've done before. So, uh, I mean, I guess it, I'll take it, I'll take it as a compliment, Josh, that you yeah. see that work going into it. So, uh, 
as well as your films, I, I know that you've worked in uh, television and theater as well. Um, and I just wondered if there was a medium you prefer or and uh, are they are they two different to even compare like? Well, theater and screen is a really different experience for everybody on the creation side um, from the from the writing, um, because when you're telling a story on stage, it really the parameters are so strict and you can do uh, only only so many characters, only so many locations, and then you really have to trust the audience's imagination to create all those worlds on a stage because no amount of set can really do that. Right. And then on the movie, uh, you know, there there's almost no limit now to what you can imagine. And, you know, whereas on stage you might write a, a 15 minute scene, it's, it's pretty rare in movies now that scenes go longer than a minute. So it's a, it's a very different process. And uh, directing is the same, you know, creating theater, although it can be very hectic, it's a, it's a long focused effort on doing the same thing over and over again. Film sets, television sets in particular, are f frenetic, and everything is always new. <laughs> wow. You're often in a new location every day, and the actors are always doing scenes they've never done before, and often working with actors they've never met until the moment. Um, and so the sort of amount of planning and control is hugely different worlds. Um, I don't have a preference. I'm actually really grateful to be able to do both kinds because it, it allows me to use different parts of my brain and creativity at different times of, of life. Um, and so I, I was going to respond to that in, in because um, I, I work in a number of mediums too and, and I agree I also uh, don't have a favorite because, you know, sometimes I want to be funny, sometimes it requires being serious. And, you know, do, doing this podcast is more of a sharing thing to learn about other people, which I also love this format as well. So I think it is, is good to have a chance to express oneself um, with different mediums. And I wanted to ask, uh, before we get too far into it, I, I think this is, you are gay, right? Uh, gay enough. Gay, gay enough, yeah. I'm straight enough, I guess. Uh, but uh, well, there you I, go. I don't know. My legs are pretty crooked, so <laughs> walking not so much. <laughs> but uh, and I, I've only not even had one drink, folks. Uh, but but um, where is this going? Yeah. Did, did you? Is that is that something that you always um, knew about yourself, or did 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 you come to a realization at one point? I think my. Uh, Sexual identity has, has been pretty much the same since I can remember being four or five years old. And I was not, uh, not under any illusions, but it was, you know, 1972, 73, and uh, there wasn't a lot to be said <laughs> at the time. You, you sort of went along with the, the flow of things back then. Right, so you didn't really... Um, you weren't able to really e e express that so openly at that time, or? Oh my gosh, uh, my beloved group of twenty cousins would tell you that at the age of five, I was running around um, in Westchester County with a purple towel on my head, claiming that my name was Valerie and mm -hmm. insisting that everybody call me that. And when we played all the games that children of my era played, I would never be the cop or the robber. I had to be the damsel in distress. Right. That was my shtick. And uh, none of my girl cousins were allowed to be the damsel in distress. <laughs> that had to be my job. You were always the damsel. That <laughs> was, was that um, troublesome for you? Or was your family based like more or less accepting? Um, <clears throat> honestly, everybody was 
pretty cool about it. And uh, I say the worst thing that ever happened to Valerie was that her long purple hair of uh, blew off uh, and got caught in my brother's bicycle spokes. <laughs> And it was a, it was really kind of a tragic demise during one of our cops and robber games. And then I I didn't know how to be Valerie anymore without the purple towel. So I don't know if you'd believe this, but apparently that happened to Valerie Bertinelli as well. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. I don't know. I don't. All Valeries lose their purple hair, I guess. I don't I don't know what's I'm pretty sure I picked Valerie from the, the Land of the Giants television show in the sixties. I, I Okay. A big fan. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that one, unfortunately. So I, I miss. I, I know the friendly giant, but that's definitely not the same thing. Um, have you, have you felt like responsible as an artist to, to um, you know, highlight LGBTQ lives and and um, perhaps deal with some of some of the issues that that folks face, or or, or do you think you're just you know, an artist first, and that might be part of the mix, or? I think as a writer, it's just the point of view that I tend to fall into most naturally. And I'd say uh, the the character that I never seem to write the point of view from is, is that of a, uh, a straight man. But, but it's, honestly, it's pretty organic. It's not like a choice. And when I think about representation, um, I've never been one to focus on trying to make positive representation of LGBTQ people. I have really tried to focus on illuminating representation. Um, sometimes you do end up, I do end up uh, working in a milieu where you have characters who haven't really been the center of a movie before Cloudburst, as an ex example. Um, you know, you had a couple of big Oscar-winning movie stars, and sh the the hero of the film was a was a butch lesbian, right. and you really hadn't seen a lot of butch lesbian characters as their romantic lead, right? Uh, in this kind of rom com before, <clears throat> and so what I find is that um, it, there's a lot of baggage that comes along with entering the kind of terrain because people aren't people people live a lot of their lives not seeing themselves characters like them represented back on screen and so the expectations run very high and then it, it never actually feels like it's your story and and there's sort of an expectation amongst people who don't see themselves a lot that when they do it's going to feel a certain way and so I, I think we, we grapple with that in the LGBTQ community a lot. And maybe it's the same in the you know, disability community um, where you kind of don't necessarily see a lot of stories centered and focused on particular kinds of characters. Um, absolutely. And I, I was going to speak a little bit about that when, when uh, so, you know, as, as a disabled person and what I often find in, in the disability community is like, oh, there's no parts for us or, you know, things like that. Or we're not represented or, or sometimes, you know, like um, I, I, I was an extra on um, the Mr. D show for uh, Bill Wood's character had a bunch of like disabled friends or whatever. And some people would say that, you know, perhaps somebody who's able-bodied shouldn't be playing a disabled character, but uh, you know, I I, th I think it depends on the scenario, and, and, and it's important not to be dogmatic about things. But my my uh, response is like, man, don't wait for parts. Like, write your own shit. And I mean, there's no guarantee that you're going to have, you know, any grandiose uh, success with it. But I'm I'm I I uh, you know. I, I essentially want to write my own stuff, so I, I'm I'm not you know and you know would I would I take a role if it was the right role and offered to me uh, absolutely but you know I I I sort of want to get my own um, few points across so that's how I feel in, in regards to disability stuff. Yeah, and you know as a as a fellow writer, I agree. Although I, I certainly respect the plight of performers who you know don't really have that. Uh, 
skill or interest in in writing roles for themselves. But I never, um, you know, they're, they're two different issues essentially. But um, I really never ask anyone about sexual identity <laughs> in the course of the audition process. It's uh, it's not it's not really okay to ask. So I, I we've got a lot of focus right now on casting, authentic casting um, in movies. And when it comes to sexual identity, I, I think that's not quite the same thing as visible minorities or differently abled people. It's, it's uh, acting is a different question. Right. Um, yes. The, the sexual identity is, is, is not as, um, uh, vi visible as you know like a, a disability thing or a or, or a racial minority or the, uh, you know i mean uh you know the if, if there was some you know question as to my authenticity it's like uh w w what are you doing committing welfare fraud no no i'm actually disabled so sorry to disappoint you but it's the truth um just before i i, I moved on um and I, I know we didn't want to get to real big issues but i was just curious your your spin on this if you thought maybe that like since since you were sort of conscious of, of your own identity in set in seventy two, have you seen um, LGBTQ rights improve? Are they still the same? Are there? I, I know it's a complicated question. And, and are are there some ways maybe where they've had a backslide and gotten even worse today? Yeah, I think it's a big world, and I think about that a lot um, every summer come Pride time, right? Um, because. You know, we live in a place where things are pretty all right. And there's been an incredible change over my lifetime in terms of, well, the, the peaceful feeling you can have as a, a minority and to feel safe for the most part. Um, and yet in other parts of the world, things are still very fraught and um, dangerous for LGBT people, and also in some places they they have gotten worse. So I try to put a little bit of effort each year into um, that kind of advocacy. Everyone loves a parade, but I think it's important at the same time to you know set aside a few hours to write some letters to our political representatives and talk about our international relations and and what's going on in parts of Africa or the Middle East where, uh, you know, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters are really suffering and try to make an impact in a broader sense. Do, do you think our politicians take heed to those letters and stuff? Or, or? <laughs> Probably not as much as I would like. Right. Yeah. 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 Because it's not, you know, it's not really changing uh, that that much in the third world perhaps in a lot of ways no but in parts of the world it is and it's sometimes nice to be part of those conversations in different ways you know um i think in not uh, you know what, what was it almost 10 years ago now but cloudburst was released in australia at the height of their political debate about same-sex marriage and it, it became a, focus, a way to focus conversation and actually have a, a piece of a story, a, a work of art to have public dialogue around. Um, and so, you know, in both ways, I think advocacy and, and also art function in these ways. I, I was really, I was really more interested in, in that story of Cloudburst. It, it wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't really interested in making a pro anything. I was really interested in these characters who had not had access to something for such a long time. The the hero was was 80 years old, and, right. and for nearly 80 years, marrying her lover was not an option. And so, when the option suddenly arose, there was a big element of sour grapes in her mind uh having having taught herself for a whole lifetime that you know maybe marriage was bullshit because it, it wasn't something that could be applied to, to her love so 
that I, I mean, I felt a lot of that myself at, at half that age um, when the world started changing around me. So I was really interested in exploring um, how they felt about it more than it being right or wrong for them. Right. No. Yeah. When you've been, when you've been, um, you know, by law having to live a certain way for most of your life and then it just changes. It's like, well, shit, like I've already been, been thinking and, and adapting this way. And, you know, it, it, it's great that these rights progress and, and there are these options, but you know, what, what, you know, it's not like we're going to, uh, you know, at, at 80 adopt babies and start a family and things like that. Right. Most likely. Well, you know, there was a big issue at the time. It was, well, now that everybody else is getting divorced, we're allowed to get married. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing else will prop up an industry. Yeah, yeah. Gay marriage is the only one that sticks together these days, perhaps, or something. I don't, I don't think anything works out nowadays, but that, that's my own cynical, dark, dark view on that matter, I guess, in general. Um, I, was, I was wondering what you might consider to be your greatest accomplishments. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I, I put you on the spot a bit there. Well, I'd like to think I haven't uh, accomplished it yet. Uh, right, you haven't hit the, yeah. No, I, I really am a very forward-looking person, I think. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of strong creative impulses, and um, I don't seem to ever really, you know, face the kind of, of block that a lot of artists face in their lives, or at least I, not, not frequently and, and not in a big way. So <clears throat> I'm just kind of always looking forward to bigger, better, um, more perfect. That's, um, that's really encouraging to hear. And I think that it's, you know, I think ultimately, um, for me too, like I would want my, my biggest accomplishment artistically to probably be my last one, you know, like, so, <laughs> and then you go out on the highest, but I think um, Dostoevsky, I, I believe his um, best, best work was Brothers Karamazov. And I think he died just shortly before it was finished or something. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that's true. And I, I, I feel much the same way. Uh, I, you know, the last year and a half, I finally got my sleep sorted out. And um, in lieu of that, I, I think I'm uh, creatively the strongest I've ever been. And, and, and I, I only hope to get better. Well, maybe, yeah, your best joke will be the one you tell right before you go. Right. Uh, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> and just bye. Um, but uh, do, you, do you have any regrets? I was just writing a scene about that. Um, where the character answered that question with every day. Every day. Every day. So, yeah, on a small scale, every day. Um, <clears throat> but I also know the pointlessness of regrets. Um, and I try to think of everything that goes terribly awry as a great opportunity to learn. And I actually think of myself that way a lot as a lifelong student and never a teacher, that when, uh, when I screw up, and I do, and it's a fairly regular basis, that that is really all part of A, being human, but B, it's kind of the essence of being an artist. You, you never learn, you never, never learn <laughs> from doing it right. So uh, it's, it's a process thing. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is an apt analogy for you, but um, I'm, a, I'm a big baseball fan. And, you know, to be a 300 hitter, which is considered uh, excellent, you know, you have to fail uh, seven out of 10 times to, to make that 300 mark. So, so to fail um, m most of the time uh, in, 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 in baseball and hitting is still excellent, you know? Well, when I was seven in Little League, um, I... I hated baseball and my mother made me play because my brothers were playing and so it just gave her a couple hours break. But my brother was pitching an absolute perfect game and I was on second base and there was a really jeezily easy pop fly and you know, I missed. It bounced off my glove, it bounced off my hat, it went on the ground. I ruined <laughs> I ruined my brother's perfect pitch game. Oh no. And he never forgave me. So that oh, was my regret. <laughs> I found it. 
My red <laughs> is missing that pop fly. On, on my baseball analogy, you found, finally found the biggest regret that you've had. Yeah, that's hilarious. Um, I, I just um, I just wanted to take uh, some time. I, I don't. I, there may there may be some other things, but I know I'm pretty sure you've got splinters in in theaters now or very soon and that you have got a it's either a tv show or a or a web series called uh cam boy about to happen yeah splinters is out in theaters in some parts of canada right now and it'll open in halifax this month sometime later in the month uh, and that is uh based on a 2010 stage play by halifax playwright leanne Poole. it's a story about uh a young woman with a fluid sexual identity who uh, is, she's, she's estranged from her mom. She's got to go home to the Annapolis Valley for her dad's funeral, fraught with tension enough, but having really uh, caused her mother great grief when she came out as a teenage lesbian, she's now uh, very hell-bent on keeping it a secret that she's been dating a man for two years who, loving boyfriend that he is, of course, takes it upon himself to, to be supportive and show up at this family funeral. Uh, it's it's uh, Shelley Thompson, who people around these parts know from Trailer Park Boys and being a great theater actress. Um, and uh, Sophia Von Zoff, a ter Toronto actress from the show Bitten, uh, is our, our lead and everybody else uh, and so he's originally from Newfoundland but everybody else in the movie is actually Nova Scotian based and it's it's that's the first time for me to have an all-Atlantic Canadian cast in a movie which I love and um, Camboy is a socially distanced television series for OUT TV okay so I was scheduled to do something else for OUT TV this year and uh, it wasn't the kind of show that looked doable a few months back. Um, so I proposed to them this Camboy show for their fall schedule, which is about uh, an out of work chorus boy because Broadway has been shut down and he's, he's gone home to Halifax and uh, trying to make ends meet, he turns to online sex work, mm -hmm. to becoming a camboy, um, and, and learns a completely different way of performing. That is really interesting. I, I don't know if I've ever told anybody this, but I almost uh, did that in about 2002 or so for a while. I almost did a did a camboy thing. Well, I think the cams would have been a little more primitive back then. So it was black and white back. Then. Yeah, maybe <laughs> black and white computers instead of black and white television. <laughs> oh well, that's fascinating. So okay, yeah, this will be helpful to me then. So so <laughs> you didn't go through with it. What stopped you? Um, my mom partly because I was still living at home. She didn't approve. Right, I was of age. Like I I would have turned nineteen in O two. So and also um, and actually um. Oh, fuck it. I'll say it. Uh, my my ex-girlfriend and I uh, did make a porn at her, her uh, like she had a market for that or whatever. And um, uh, I, I, I'm interested in that perhaps as part of my identity. But my, my, my fear is that I, you know, get pigeonholed into that. And I, I perhaps literally in some ways. And, and um, So you're not going to drop a link right now where people can go check this out she, she doesn't like me anymore so i don't have access to my own porno i guess so, <laughs> so she could drop the link if she wants to comment on this i suppose hatefully perhaps that's gotta hurt um yeah uh but no oh, that's interesting and i i love the fact that you were talking about you know as as much as possible having a all um a, a atlantic uh cast and that's i think phenomenal and uh yeah i was really uh, thrilled about that i was so excited to shoot in the Annapolis Valley, which is just, I think, one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and really being able to actually show it to the world in a story that's set there on film, because um, I'm sure the Annapolis Valley has played America pretty often, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's not just about the looks, it's, it's a flavor, right? It's that sweet scent of apples everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember that from, from grade four. 
going on Apple picks is the class trip stuff is great. I, I was curious, like, what advice would you have for a young, you know, filmmaker, television creator, theater maker who's, who's maybe just starting out or maybe has been doing things for a while is trying, trying to make it? What, what would you, um, what, what, what might you suggest for them? Well, I, I would give the a, a couple pieces of advice that I got when I was young, and I found them both very helpful. The first one is to show up. Um, right. You know, it's it doesn't necessarily matter how much. I mean, it, it matters how much talent you have. It matters about the work that you put in. But you know, uh, you can write a very good screenplay, and you can mail it to every producer and distributor in the world, but. And they can read it and be moved by it. Right. But they're not going to call you. Right. Mm. So their world is populated with opportunities to meet other people. You've got your Toronto Film Festival, your Atlantic Film Festival, your Sundance. Um, you know, don't wait to be invited. You uh, save your pennies and show up uh, at these industry events. And it makes a big difference when you're ready to pitch your project, if the people you're pitching to have seen your face around for the last year or so at these various industry types of events. And the best piece of advice I got one very nervous day at the Toronto Film Festival um, was to bear in mind, as humiliating as it may be, to have to go ask somebody for money mm. <laughs> or permission to make your work of art that those people whose business it is to uh, allocate that money um, they need you just as much as you need them Th those people who are executives and are not artists and who cannot create the products themselves absolutely need your talent. So, you know, there's, there's a weird sense of hierarchy mm -hmm. when someone controls the purse strings mm -hmm. and, and you don't necessarily feel like you're the necessary component to creating the work of art, but you really are as an artist. They don't understand your unique point of view. Um, often the artist is a younger person with a different sensibility and a different sense of the audience. All of these things factor into leveling the playing field and not having to feel sheepish and embarrassed about uh, having to go grovel <laughs> to, for that support to realize your dreams. Right. Um, that that's I really take from that that you're saying that show up, you know, be be seen in person, be, have your have your face known, and also that as an artist, you are an essential part of the equation. So you know um, uh, these you know big wigs aren't aren't uh, you know necessarily um, more important than you. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship where uh, we we all sort of need each other. That's right. We need each other, and uh, you know. Sometimes these situations can be very intimidating for a young artist. Uh, they were for me, but coming to an understanding that there is no movie if you don't write it. There is no movie if no one directs it. That really helped to be able to sit across from a distributor or a network executive and, and really share with them the vision that I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think um, you've you've answered this um, to, to some degree in, in just what you've just said. But I just this is my curious mind. I was curious what what you might like. What percentage would be you know an artist's talent versus their connections versus just pure luck? Oh gosh, uh, well connections can be made. You don't have to be born with them or raised with them. Um, but of course, they count. You you got to make them. Um, and what was the third one? Luck? Yeah, just pure <laughs> luck. Maybe that doesn't factor in your opinion, but oh no, there there does. So you know, my career in movies started out with a, a 
pretty fairy tale experience. I I wrote a script uh, out in Duncan's Cove called The Hanging Garden, and um, I scraped together a couple of grants to go around to like Scotland and, and Sundance trying to introduce it and, and put it together. And things went just remarkably well. But all of those things, having been guided by some, um, you know, the assistant of a sales agent advised me to keep showing up. Right. And, uh, and I know then when I, when I found myself luckily sitting across from that sales agent that, uh, you know, we, we'd met three times at parties. So it was a very different, comfortable situation. Right. When um, on the luck side, maybe it's not all luck, but, um, you know, I remember the, dis- the distributor ha- uh, at the same time as that film was coming out had a film that everybody wanted. Every theater wanted this movie. And I can't think of the name. It was about giant bugs in space. Starship Troopers. Do I have that right? Yeah. So Starship Troopers was going to be, you know, the Star Wars of its time. Right. And, And the distributor was able to actually say, yeah, you can have Starship Troopers and the half a billion dollars it's going to make, but you have to take my weird little gay movie from Nova Scotia (laughs) (laughs) at the same time. And and so in that regard, it got a much wider release. And so I guess there's shrewdness there on the part of a distributor, but also a lot of luck and also some luck. And I guess I love Starship Troopers, but it, it, it did not instantly catch fire at the box office. Right. So um, a lot of a lot of that audience may have have gone over to the, the next door to the multiplex. Uh, so luck is a big part of everything, and then eventually we all have bad luck too. So right. Yeah. Luck. You luck know. factors in. Everybody in movies having bad luck right now, Josh. Well, this is fantastic. Um, I I, review, I I'm gonna I'm gonna ask my. My close question, how I always uh, ask everybody to, uh, to finish off, what is the meaning of life to Tom Fitzgerald? <sighs> well, I don't know yet. I'm still working it out, but I guess, uh, you know, trying to understand each other. Just, it's a lifelong effort to be able to actually understand and appreciate each other's point of view. He's not saying kumbaya, folks, but he is saying respect each other. Folks, he's been Tom Fitzgerald. I've been Josh Dunn. I really appreciated having him on. And like I tell you every time, especially when you're feeling low, look yourself in the mirror, give yourself that Ric Flair. Woo! And tell yourself, I am the greatest of all time because you are. Good night, folks. Thanks, Tom.